Good morning, Fresh Start Church. Welcome to our online experience. We are so happy that you decided to tune in for worship today. Prepare your hearts and your minds. And let's get ready for worship. God, we just begin to look to you. For you are where our help comes from, God. And all of our help is in you. Come on, church, just begin to get in a posture of worship. As we worship our God, as we worship our King, as we lift up his name in this moment. Come on, Melina, sing it out. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, you where my help comes from, give me wisdom, you know just what to do. To see things like you do, God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed, give me wisdom, for you know just what to do, and I will love you, Lord, my strength, and I will
forever all my days Yes, I will love you Oh, I will love you I will love you Forever all my days Hallelujah Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Pastor Alex, for the opportunity to speak today. I am Elder Vivian Burrell, and all things considered, I'm blessed to be here today. If you've ever heard me speak before, you know there's always a story that goes with the opportunity, and I will not disappoint today. So I must admit, the day, the very recent day that I was asked to deliver this message, I was inundated with work and duties from every direction. And on top of that, most times when I'm required to speak, I feel like the Holy Spirit has given me a heads up and I'm already prepared, prepared for something. This time was a little different. It took me off guard because the only thing God had given me was what I thought was a word for next year. From the pulpit and not virtually. You see, on my walk a couple months ago, I thought God was prepared me to speak and it was for an occasion, one of those traditional speeches. Today it will not be such. So I ask you to be prepared with me to take this message from off the beaten path titled, You're Just Like Your Daddy. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I give you thanks and I give you praise, God, that you are real in my life. Hallelujah. I thank you, God, that you've prepared me for such a moment as this. And God, my prayer is that your message, your word will reach your people. It will fall on fertile ground, God. Holy Spirit, we ask you to have your way today. We thank you, God, that you increase as I decrease. And Father God, you will add to the body. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. All right, as I said, my message today, you're just like your daddy. How many times have we heard or said those words? You're just like your daddy. For some, this might be a compliment. For others, not so much. It all depends on when we hear the words. There are times when we say it to indicate an incredible resemblance to an offspring. You might hear things like, 
you're just like that man. You sound just like him. You even walk just like him. He can't deny you. And then at other times, you'll hear Father say, he reminds me of me when I was his age. I was a good athlete, just like him. And it's no different for us girls, except for we don't want to say that we look like the dad if they're not pretty, right? <laughs> then there's times you'll hear a parent say to another parent, he's just like you, and it doesn't sound very complimentary. That's when you know that that child or young adult is not behaving the way the parents want them to. Oh, we're quick to pass off a child, especially if they are behaving in a way that brings embarrassment and don't let it be disrespectful. We will totally disown our children. Oh, I've heard it many times before from my mother. You didn't get that from me. That came from the Davenport side of the family. You're just ugly with all of the facial expressions to include. Today, I want to talk to you about some characteristics of our Heavenly Father who never changes his mind about us or about whose we are. Now, there are some of you out there saying to themselves, I don't even know my Father, and this message isn't for me. Let me encourage you before you turn me off. The Bible says God is a father to the fatherless. During these trying and absolutely exhausting times, we all need a father. We need a covering, a strong tower to run into. So hang in there with me for a while and see what thus says the Lord. I've narrowed down six characteristics that I wouldn't mind being accused of being just like my daddy. And you may ask, why six? It was six that just hit me in the right way. So let's get started. My father is a perfect protector. When I think of this, so many things go through my mind. There are children out there that doesn't or didn't see their father as a protector for many reasons. Maybe due to abuse, some due to absenteeism, or some fathers are just weak about being a dad. But the Bible tells us so many times that God is our protector. Psalms 27 states, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they stumble and fall. If, not, if that's not protection, more of this comes from 2 Thessalonians 3 and 3. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. I've shared this story before, but I really think that it's relevant now. And so I want to tell you, when I was really young, I was terrified of storms. And once a tornado came through Alabama without my father being home. Now that in and of itself brought a level of anxiety that I couldn't explain. My mother did all that she could do to keep us safe, even to the point of stuffing us under the beds. But it was not until my father's presence came in that I was to be calm. All of the signs of the storm were still about. The atmosphere was still filled with lightning, thunder, winds, but it was not until my father walked through that door that I was calm. Children of God, we should feel that way right now. In the midst of this storm called a pandemic, we must enter into the presence of God and find calm. Regardless of the resurgence of COVID numbers, regardless of loss of economy, and regardless of the outcome of an election, we must find safety in the presence of the Lord. During this time, one of my most powerful scriptures for me has been Psalms 119, 116. Sustain me, O oh my God, according to your purpose, and I will live. Do not let my hopes be dashed. That tells me that if I know God holds me, if I know God keeps me, I can hold on to my hope. I know I'm gonna be all right. 
and so will you. Sometimes God's protection comes in the form of peace and strength in the middle of despair, just like now. We must choose to believe he will protect us. Other times his protection comes as an ending because he sees something more on the horizon than we cannot see. If it's an end to a relationship or any other thing, put a period there, let it go, end it, and then wait on God to send something better. He will never leave us or forsake us. Number two, God lets us make our own decisions. This is one of my favorites, and true to myself, most of them are my favorites. But God lets us make our own decisions. We as parents want our, want our children to do the, what we want them to do because we feel like we know what's best. And this may be true, but our God gives us free will. He doesn't turn his back on us. While yes, he has expectations of us, and so does our Heavenly Father. But he doesn't disown us or turn his back when we select a different path. A wise and loving and patient father waits. Look at the prodigal son. The father is symbolic of God the Father. He allowed his son to take his portion of the inheritance when he wanted it. Now I truly believe the father knew he was too young to manage all of that money, but he allowed him to make his own decisions. I believe that he knew it was only a matter of time before he would squander all of that money and he would return. When he returned, the father waited. The son returned hungry, tattered, and worn. His father welcomed him with open arms. Unlike some of us, our earthly fathers, he didn't greet his son with anger. He didn't greet him with condescending, I told you so. He wasn't cold. He didn't stop speaking to him. Conversely, he welcomed him with open arms and provided him with some of the best homecoming gifts that a child could have. The same is true for us. Even though we know better and decide to do otherwise, God waits on us to come back in whatever condition we're in, hurt, brokenhearted, with our tails between our legs, he gives us a soft place to land. The Bible says he causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That means when you come back to his best plan, you find what you needed, and you find that he's able to make those mistakes work for the good for you, not only now, but for the rest of your life. Amen? Number three, you never have to earn God's love. Did I tell you that's my favorite? That's my favorite. You never have to earn God's love. Like me, you may have felt you needed to do something to earn your dad's love and approval by accomplishing great things, by doing great things, walking a straight line. Now my father, he loved me, but it was when I was doing the right things that he seemed to smile a little larger and walk a little taller. When I was on the honor roll, when I was playing my best basketball, when I joined the military to help pay for college, oh, his chest was stuck out. But when I was engaging in those things that he felt unacceptable, there was a stone face, no fanfare. I didn't hear cheering from him. But our Heavenly Father is not like that. Romans 5 and 8 tells us that God demonstrates his love in this way. While we were still sinners, wrap your head around that, powerful. While we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'm going to say it again. While we were still sinners, 
while we were still doing our own thing, while we were still messing up, while we were still on the other side of the fence, while we were still not measuring up, Christ died for us. God loves us. While we're oblivious to him and his love, he sent his son to die for us. I don't know about you, but that's unconditional, sacrificial love that is unlike anything that I have and that I will ever experience on this side of heaven. God is a father who chose to love us and we didn't do a thing to earn it. No matter how good you present, no matter how many great the accomplishments we have, it doesn't contribute not one iota to how much God already loves us and vice versa. No matter how bad we feel, no matter how low we feel about ourselves, God loves us the same. He is no respecter of person. He still loves us, period, if I can use that, period. Number four, God loves us even to, enough to discipline us. Amen, amen. Now, some of us may have a hard time with this, and I'm certainly one of those people. I came from a family that literally believed they did not think that anything you said or done should go without the proverbial whooping. So I understand if you have a hard time with this one. But if we were disciplined in anger and not love, it's particularly hard to connect to. And it's especially hard for our young children. Think about this. To equate love with a painful action. That's a dichotomy, right? When you're looking angry and hitting your child and taking away their favorite toy or telling them they can't come out of the room, it's difficult to equate that with love. I remember one of the first times I spanked my son and he said, I thought you said you loved me. We must be careful to know the difference between punishment and discipline. Amen? One of the definitions of punishment is severe handling and treatment. That doesn't even sound like it equates to a behavior of another human being. It breaks my heart to know that children will equate that that is for their good. And it certainly is not a descriptor of my God. My Heavenly Father is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. If it feels good to punish our children, we need to check ourselves. We're doing something outside of discipline and love. I've never enjoyed, as I said, giving physical correction. As a matter of fact, when I had to spank my son, it made me even more angrier because I knew I was going to feel awful afterwards. God's word in Proverbs says, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father the son he delights in. This does not sound like a God that is trying to hurt us with discipline. Discipline in and of itself sends the connotation that it's being, you're being trained in how to act in accordance with God's will. When his children become hard-headed or stiff-necked, then we bring that disciplinary action on ourselves. God loves us and wants us to live in peace. He may make us wait or take something away to protect us, but he does not delight in punishing us. That is not God's way. Amen? Number five, God has our very best in mind. I'll say it one more time. This is my favorite. It's natural for us to be selfish and consider themselves before anyone else. So if you had a dad, let me just tell you, who was unselfish, and unwilling and was willing to, to sacrifice his own comfort for yours, you had a gift. 
you had a glimpse of what our Heavenly Father is like. Many times our fathers believe that providing monetary value to the home is all that's required. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. If more of our fathers was involved, especially with the girls, we would have a greater population of young women feeling a self-worth that was uncompromising. Amen. No good thing does God withhold from those who walk uprightly from us. That's the Bible. It's more than money. It's more than going to that job. God would not withhold any good thing from us, and I'm certainly not saying that we need to provide our children with everything that we can imagine. But if it's God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, we need to let our children know that they are worth it to receive the good things from us. That means it gives him joy to give us gifts that is true to us. Not just those tangible things like money and, and all of the, the, the feel good gifts, but it's inclusive of giving quality time, honest communication, time of care and affection, Jesus said, if you then, though you are evil, in Matthew 11 says that, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give a good gift to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to you that ask him? So let's be clear, God wants us to have the good things. He provides us with the good things. Love or punishment and taking the good things away is not God's way. God not only has the ability to give us anything we desire, as long as it's good for us, He also knows our situations down the road, and He knows what's best for us in the long run. Trust Him. So don't be mad if you didn't get that run-of-the-mill job. Don't be upset when you, got, you didn't get that lemon of a car that you was praying for. Don't be mad when that mediocre mate walked out on you. Don't be mad. Rejoice. God desires to give you the best. Wish them well and move on. Amen? Number six, God knows us intimately. For real, for real, this is my favorite. This is my favorite. God knows us intimately. As a therapist, as a social worker, one of the things I do know is that one of our deepest needs in the human race is to be known intimately. That's our desire. It's nothing better when you can walk into your home and perhaps flowers or a meal is prepared for you and you didn't have to ask. It's nothing better that you can look in the eyes of someone and receive a hug and not even have to ask for it. It's a blessing to be known intimately. Let's not be tricked. Don't put someone on the pedestal and make them think that they can do that for you. God is the only one that knows us that well. He may have blessed you with someone who can meet many of those things, but God is the only one that knows us in true intimacy. Sometimes we'll hide who we really are, and it's a tragedy that we do it out of fear or rejection because we're afraid of how a person will respond to us when they really get to know us. That's not how our God is. Even when God knows us intimately, the ugly side, the quirks, the things that we can't even explain, God loves us. He loves us even more when you are even in those little moods, in those quirks. He loves that because guess what? The Bible says in Psalms 139, 13, he says, you formed me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Let me tell you what that means. That means that God was watching the development when we was baking in the womb. How about that? 
How about that? There are no mistakes. So if I have some quirks, if I do things a little different, ask God to help you love me the way he loves me because he was watching. He was providing oversight when it was happening. Amen? He knows the hair on my head. He knows the thoughts before I can even conceptualize them. And he still loves me. Let me tell you, I've lived with the man for 31 years. And if he knew some of the thoughts that ran through my head when I was around him, I know for a fact he would look at me sideways. I know this. But even God knows these thoughts. I'm ashamed of them sometimes. But he loves me still. The good, the bad, and the in-between. God still loves us. He loves us intimately. So whenever we say or hear the phrase, you're just like your daddy, let's be confident that we can say with a smile, I sure am. I'm striving to be a protector, just like my father. When my loved ones make decisions that are contrary to my advice, I love and support them even more. I will never make my loved ones feel as though they may need to earn my love. I will give it liberally, just like my daddy in heaven. I will show love even in the times of discipline. I will look for ways to demonstrate love through good gifts. And let me be clear, as I stated earlier, I'm well aware that all of us did not have a father that demonstrated those qualities. But I want to take this opportunity to encourage you. You may have experienced a loss, but you didn't miss out. Abba Father, our Heavenly Father, longs for a relationship with us. He desires that he filled that space. You did not miss out. He is available and he wants to fill all of the six characteristics that I said and even more. I encourage you, if you do not have a relationship with the Father and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, take this step and acknowledge it now by indicating it on the device to the number provided on the screen. He's patiently waiting for you. If you've accepted Jesus as your personal savior and somehow you fell out of relationship with him and you want to rededicate your life back to him, then this is a perfect opportunity to reconnect, to find that loving relationship with the heavenly father. And lastly, if you've accepted Jesus as your personal savior and you want Fresh Start to be your church home, this is an awesome time to connect with some of God's best. What me whatever manner is appropriate for you, I offer Jesus Christ to you. And you too can say, I am indeed just like my daddy. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I offer salvation, I offer rededication, and even a time to reconnect in a church home. Lord God, it is your will that we recognize you as our Heavenly Father. You provided, Father God, earthly fathers. And just in our humanity, God, we fall short. But God, I pray and I tug on the hearts of those who may be out there that is not connected to you. I pray, Father God, for their encouragement and their strength to indicate that they want to come into your fold. For those for rededication and a church home, God, allow them to know the trust, that first step of faith, to connect with people, Lord, that you've ordained to reach out to them. We thank you and we bless you. We honor the Holy Spirit. We give you glory, God, and thank you for this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.